Hello, I'm Milton Bennett, and today I'm talking with nurse educators about the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity and some of the theoretical and um, um, epistemological grounding of that model. What I mean by that is that the theory of the developmental model is um, underlying much of the curriculum of the course that you're currently enrolled in. And the epistemology refers to the underlying philosophical positions that uh, are also important to the way in which the curriculum has been uh, developed for this course and which I will give you some information about as it relates to the developmental model. What I will do is spend some time first uh, describing to you the philosophy and the model itself and then spend some time telling you about each stage of the model and how it is that you can recognize people, both yourself and others, uh, who are operating at that stage. And then for those of you who are working on your own development, as well as those of you who are facilitating other people's development, I will be talking about those kinds of activities that are appropriate to each stage and what some of the problems are uh, of using activities that might be less appropriate uh, for that stage. The underlying assumption of the uh, model is uh, a constructivist assumption. And let me say what I mean by that, comparing it to other assumptions that are made or have been made anyway, uh, in the area of intercultural relations. A very important one, one that is currently um, being questioned heavily and uh, fought against by many people uh, around the issue of uh, institutional racism, sexism, and other such issues, is the idea of a kind of uh, absolute reality in which there is a um, a hierarchy of civilizations. Uh, there are the civilized people. Those are the people who create the model, of course. Then there are the barbarians. Those are people who could be civilized with the help of the civilized people, thus uh, supporting ideas of colonialism, neocolonialism, imperialism, or what we Americans uh, like to call nation building. And then in this original idea, there were also the savages. These are the people who really weren't as human as the civilized or even the barbarians. And so they had no hope of becoming civilized and it was okay to exploit them. As you recognize, this is the basis of slavery, not only back when slavery was legal, but even today as all other kinds of slavery, sex slavery, child labor slavery, and other kinds of slavery continue to exist with the rationale that the people who are doing that work are not uh, civilizable, basically. This comes from a, a philosophy of universalism, that there is one truth and that we have that truth and that other people either have that truth or if they don't, there's something wrong with them. Maybe we can fix them, maybe not. But in any case, the important thing is we who have the truth deserve to be on top. We deserve to be dominant. That's the assumption. Uh, and of course, we're fighting against that assumption in most of the work that we do around uh, intercultural relations. The important shift that occurred at the beginning of last century by uh, anthropologists and joined by many, many other people was the shift into relativism or sometimes called postmodernism. Uh, here, the idea is that cultures were not part of a, a unitary um, reality, but were uh, independent contexts uh, that we needed to understand each culture in terms of itself. So you couldn't understand Somali culture in terms of American or French culture. You had to understand Somali culture in itself. Uh, and by extension, you couldn't understand um, a black experience from a white perspective, nor could you understand white experience from a black perspective or a man's experience from a woman's perspective and so forth. This was the idea of relativism. This worked rather well to take us out of the universalism, although as you know, there are still many people who would like to bring us back into that universalist idea, <laughs> people who consider themselves to be more civilized or 
in many cases, people who have some stake in continuing to exploit people that they think are less civilized than they are. Uh, nevertheless, this has uh, gone a long way in most contexts uh, to making us at least question that universalist assumption and to seek alternatives to it. What we've learned since the development of that relativism is that these different contexts are in fact more fluid than we thought. Uh, that when we develop a context, a cultural context, it's not that it actually exists, it not, it's not that there really are Japanese people and Americans and Costa Ricans, but that these are boundaries that we create amongst us as human beings, uh, which differentiate us, which call attention to some differences in our experience or differences in the way that we deal with reality that we draw these boundaries and further we can draw these boundaries differently and in different ways. Uh, so for instance, we can create an ethnic boundary that cuts across national boundary or a gender boundary that cuts across uh, ethnic boundaries, or we can create a, a, a superordinate boundary such as the European Union, which, uh, which brings other boundary conditions uh, inside of it. Uh, that this idea of constructing boundaries is the basis of constructivism. It's the basis of how we have moved from this idea of relativism where cultures had their own context, but which really were not able to interact very well with one another into the idea of cultures having their own context, but also being able to exist in a boundary that has been constructed for the purpose of allowing interaction amongst those cultures. This last step of creating the boundary condition for us to be able to interact with one another is a necessary step for us to move from the idea of being respectful of different cultures to being able to coordinate societies where those different cultures work together uh, in multicultural, some form of multicultural cooperation. So it's this idea, this constructivist idea that's at the basis of the developmental model which I will now describe to you. This model um, called the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity is modeling our perceptual experience of difference. It follows the basic idea of um, uh, many developmental psychologists, Piaget and many others, uh, who point out that children inevitably learn how to make finer and finer distinctions how to create more categories about things that they need to know about. If a young child is learning about different kinds of horses, he or she learns how to categorize different types of horses and uh, in ways that those of us who don't know much about horses look and we say, oh, well, it's a four-legged animal, but that people who know about horses are able to bring many, many more distinctions to bear. Uh, my son uh, knows a lot about mountain bikes. And so I, I look at a bicycle and say, it's a bicycle. He says, no, daddy, it's a downhill bike or it's a enduro bike or it's a mountain bike. And so he has many categories for dealing with uh, difference. Wine connoisseurs learn how to categorize many, many different kinds of wine and so forth. So this model uses that same idea to talk about culture. What it suggests is that when we move from having a simple perception of otherness or people who are not in our group anyway, when we have a simple perception of them, it leads us to behave in ways that appear ethnocentric and sometimes racist uh, or sexist. When we have more complex ways of perceiving others, it allows us to move in a direction that is uh, more empathic, that is more uh, what I will call ethno-relative. So ethnocentrism refers to the way in which we see our own culture as being central to all of reality. It's essentially that uh, universalist idea. The ethno-relativism is a more relativist idea where we see our culture as being relative to other cultures and uh, which I will put into the context of constructivism as well. Let me briefly describe these stages to you and then I'll go back in more detail. The denial stage, uh, the, the, which is the default condition, it's the place where all of us start, is failing to perceive the existence or the relevance of culture. These are people who basically 
have no categories or only vague categories for otherness. They know that there's there are other people out there, but they really don't have much contact with other people. And as a result, they just don't think about it. I think it's important for us to realize that most people uh, are not against other cultures. They just don't think about other people. They just don't, don't it's not a fact, it's not irrelevant to them. But if people at denial are pushed into contact with others, which of course frequently occurs uh, in our increasingly multicultural societies and the global village, uh, then that moves into defense. And defense is building specific cultural groups, um, perceiving them in polarized or evaluative ways. It's essentially us and them, uh, where us are the good guys and them are the bad guys, but sometimes it's reversed so that us are the bad guys, them are the good guys, that's sometimes called internalized colonialism or internalized uh, sexism and so forth, where uh, we change sides. But the, but the underlying idea is the same that we are maintaining an us and them distinction. Uh, we see others in more stereotypical terms and ourselves in generally uh, richer or more complex terms. This gives way, uh, not always, but uh, in situations that demand at least tolerance of one another, uh, this gives way to minimization. Minimization is focusing on common human experience and universal values. And its major, major purpose is to reduce prejudice. So it's the stage that brings us out of a simplistic or stereotypical view of the other and allows us to see other people as being basically human. Unfortunately, we tend to see them as human like us. That is, we, we project our own idea of reality on others and assume that they are having a similar experience. But nevertheless, uh, it's an improvement over thinking that they're having a simpler experience uh, or even an inhuman experience compared to us. Then the move across this little uh, longer line here is the move into acceptance. And this is the real shift into ethno-relativism, which it allows us to attribute equal human complexity to others, um, but also equal humanity. So we see other people as being equally human, but differently complex uh, to ourselves. And uh, this is the basis for our then being able to learn about other cultures, uh, interact with other cultures in ways that don't assume that they must be like us. And if they're not, there's something wrong with them. This in turn allows us to do adaptation. And in many cases, this is what's called for, particularly in healthcare situations where uh, we need to be able to adapt our behavior to generate appropriate and authentic alternative behavior. And by authentic, it means that it is still committed to your own values, to your own task, to your own uh, goal of, 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 of providing uh, appropriate health care, but it's doing that by using alternative methods of, 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 uh, of implementation. It's, it's kind of like um, singers who have a repertoire of songs and that, that repertoire doesn't mean that they're singing better or worse, they're continuing to convey emotion, they're continuing to demonstrate their expertise, but they're doing so uh, with uh, different songs, different kinds of music. Uh, and then finally in integration, we are uh, including this kind of idea of contextual uh, decision-making uh, and ethical commitment while being respectful of alternative views, we're in integrating that into our ongoing way of dealing with one another. Integration here means something like coordination, that we are, inter so it doesn't mean social integration as, a, as opposed to segregation. It means uh, incorporating these kinds of differences into ourselves in such a way as to be able to then operate in this more ethno-relative way. To uh, connect this back to what we were just talking about, uh, the first three stages uh, are the universalist stages. These are the ones that are that in which the underlying epistemological assumption, that is the assumption about the nature of reality, uh, is one in which there is a single reality um, that if everybody looked in the same direction, they would see the same thing. I'll speak of some um, ramifications of that here in a moment. The relativism allows us to get past that minimization into acceptance, but doesn't allow us to move very far into adaptation because as you recall, relativism is based on the idea of discrete and pretty separate contexts 
that there's not much of a mechanism for those contexts to interact with one another. And in fact, some people who are very strong in that relativist position say it's impossible for somebody from one context to truly understand somebody from another context. This uh, finally uh, then demands the shift to constructivism, which allows us now to construct an alternative reality, alternative experience that allow us in fact to understand others uh, more in their terms than in our terms. Something similar happens when you go to the theater or read a good novel or, or go to a play or go to a cinema movie. Uh, where you're drawn into a character uh, and share to, of course, the scripted experience of that character in a way that may be quite outside of your own experience. So this is something that we all know how to do. It's just we don't generally use it for cross-cultural purposes. And that's what this is uh, suggesting here, is that we move into a more cross-cultural application of this, of, of empathy, which we already know how to do. Now, uh, what I will do is go through each of these stages and give you a, a little bit more information about it, but specifically uh, help you to identify what people tend to say, some of the assumptions that they make when they are operating at this stage, some of the, and then finally, some of the things that you could do or not do uh, that would be helping people from this stage to develop into the next stage uh, of development. And this uh, would apply to yourself as well as to people that you may be teaching or in other ways facilitating. So this first stage of denial is associated with a disinterest in other cultures. As I said, you know, we culture uh, you know, doesn't care about uh, health, for instance, uh, or also some kind of avoidance of, of cultural difference. For instance, uh, people who live sometimes in gated communities, uh, although they don't admit it openly, uh, are doing so because it makes it more likely they'll be living in a homogeneous situation with other people uh, and not uh, be around a lot of difference. People sometimes who go to private schools uh, uh, have a similar kind of interest, although frequently that's not stated very openly. Uh, over the years, as I've worked with different healthcare organizations, uh, in terms of this model, I've listened to what people say at these different stages as I have they've measured or been diagnosed in other ways. And here are some typical things that healthcare workers say. By healthcare workers, I mean not just nurses, but uh, um, medical doctors uh, and staff and other people who work in the healthcare context. One of the things that commonly is disease doesn't care about your culture. Basically, that's based on the idea that bodies are bodies, uh, that this is a biological issue. This is not a cultural issue. And as a result, we need not be terribly concerned with culture. This, as you can see, uh, supports a kind of denial uh, position. Uh, as long as we all speak the same language, there's no problem. Uh, so this is the idea of reducing culture to basically a language issue, meaning that if we did speak the same language, we would be referring to the same reality. It's not that we have different experiences. We have the same experience, we just use a different language to talk about it, which is a denial uh, positions, denying the uh, uh, underlying different experience associated with cultural worldview. Uh, and this next one, I've been working with various cultural groups for years and never had a problem. I call this the great driver uh, issue. You know, I'm a great driver because I've never had an accident. Of course, that ignores all of the other people who are, who are, who are uh, trying to get out of your way as you're weaving down the, the road. And similarly, around cultural issues, a lot of people who, who haven't had a problem, or at least they don't recognize that they've had a problem in cross-cultural situations, in fact, are not able to estimate how hard everybody else is working to uh, avoid, uh, the, <laughs> to ad adapt basically to them. This is particularly true for MDs and others who are in the you know, higher status positions in the, in, in the healthcare uh, profession. Uh, because, of course, because they are higher status, other people do have a tendency to adapt to them. And so the higher status person comes in with his or her culture, uh, essentially uh, imposes that culture on everyone else. Everyone else adapts to that uh, culture because the person is higher status or has the potential, has potential power over them. And the person then who's doing the, uh, the, the, the dominating says, I must be really culturally sensitive because I've never had a cultural problem. So you, you see how that goes. It's essentially the denial of, of, uh, of cultural difference. So when we're dealing with denial, 
um, there, there are a few things that we need to be doing. One of them is to deal with easy differences. So you don't, now is not the time to talk about differences in values, differences in worldview experience, all of the kinds of things which eventually are really important to talk about. But when people are dealing, uh, are coming out of denial or you would like to facilitate that or you're dealing with those issues yourself, that this is the time to talk about easy differences, different differences in customs, differences in dress, differences in food. This is kind of Mexico night, you know, where we uh, where we celebrate um, Mexican music and Mexican food. And of course, uh, from a more sophisticated perspective, that may look superficial. Uh, but from a developmental perspective, it's an absolutely necessary thing to do. And it's exactly the process that every single one of us has gone through as we develop expertise in some area. There is not one of us who is an expert in something that stepped into that expertise in one step. No, we went through a process of developing sophistication in our perception, and that's what's going on uh, here as well. We may, I'll make a small aside here. We need to be careful to not assume that this is a transformational as opposed to a, a developmental issue. We need, to, we need to realize that this is not a matter of people having scales over their eyes, of, of having bias, uh, and, and that somehow if they just drop the scales from their eyes and drop their biases, drop their prejudice, that they would move back into some kind of a, of a better way of relating to one another. When in fact, the, the history of our species is that we don't relate to otherness very well. You know, that uh, if, if troops of, of, of primates come into contact with other troops of primates, they, they, they run away as fast as they can. And if they can't run away, they fight and they try to kill the other group. And, you know, pretty much, you know, we humans who you know, are, <laughs> you know, are the inheritors of, of a primate past, we, we humans have a similar tendency. We don't naturally get along well with other people. What we've done now is we've created a condition in the world through multicultural societies, immigration, a refugee movement, uh, easy transportation and communication, global economic cooperation. All of these factors have thrown us into contact with difference in a way that is basically unnatural unnatural in the sense that it doesn't follow our species heritage. And as a result, we cannot assume that if we just stop doing something, we'll move back into a better way of relating to one another. That's, we never had a good way of relating to one another. What we're trying to do is develop something, a new competence, a new skill that we haven't really ever had before. And so that's why we need to go through this process that we go through in any other new expertise. Uh, which is slowly developing the ability to perceive things in more sophisticated ways. This is a good time to use a translator or a mediator um, who uh, can step in and basically provide uh, information about how people are uh, operating uh, cross-culturally that may not be available to them otherwise. Uh, and finally, um, don't focus too much on change, just enough to allow some adjustment to different contexts, because you don't want to say to people, uh, the world is different and, you know, change, you know, get on the train or miss the train. That's not a good way of dealing with somebody who's essentially dealing with issues of stability. So here, here's what's going on at this stage. People are concerned with having enough stability to maintain their lives. Uh, and they see around them change. And there are people who, because they have the advantage of greater education, greater experience, sometimes uh, uh, coming from more, uh, from higher socioeconomic conditions, or maybe from a dominant culture in a society, uh, they have the, the privilege, basically, of dealing with change in a little uh, more, um, in an easier way, shall we say. And these two, this, these two positions then tend to become exaggerated. The stability people uh, fight with the change people. The change people fight with the stability people. The change people say, if we have too much stability, it generates stagnation. And of course, they're correct. That's, that is true. On the other hand, the stability people say, if we have too much change, it generates chaos. And they also are correct. So what we have here is a kind of a fight between the potential of moving 
into stagnation or the potential of moving into chaos. I, I'm sure you can see this kind of political activity occurring uh, right now at many places in the world. The solution to this and other of these conundrums that are associated with uh, this developmental model is to put these things into a dialectic, to reconcile them, to see them as operating together rather than against one another. And so the, the way to do this is every time you think about change, you say, and how will that generate new stability? And every time you think about stability, you say, and how will that allow inevitable change? And that when we're able to do that, at least to some extent, the stability is more likely to become the, the, the security, which we basically need. And the change is more likely to become the kind of adjustment that we need inevitably to make to uh, changing conditions around us since things in fact do not stay the same. Uh, this is a delicate process to do this kind of reconciliation or this creation of a dialectic. And we must uh, uh, approach this uh, intentionally and carefully rather than saying to people, stop being stupid and open your eyes and see the new world. That's, that's not gonna work. The, one of the reasons it doesn't work is because when people move out of denial, they don't move into ethno-relativism, they move into defense. And defense is recognizing other people, seeing other people. You see other people as people, but they become threatening. You see them in kind of simplistic and threatening ways, and they're likely to then uh, become um, a, a, you know, a potential threat to you. It's like the groups of primates that, first of all, were just they didn't run into any other groups of primates, so it was OK. Now, suddenly, they're forced into contact with the other primates. What are we going to do? Well, we got to fight with them. We have limited resources. It's us or them. So we denigrate others. We talk about the superiority of ourselves, or as I mentioned before, we may reverse from time to time and see ourselves as being the bad guys and them as being the good guys. Uh, this happens sometimes when people go native uh, as part of an uh, international experience, uh, as the term is used. Uh, but sometimes it occurs within your own society when people of a dominant um, cultural group recognize that they have been oppressive to people from non-dominant groups and so they start taking on the cause of the non-dominant group uh, against their own dominant group. Um, Malcolm X, uh, a, a, a black uh, uh, leader in the U.S. Uh, was once said this once said that uh, to a young white woman who was saying to her, oh Malcolm I just love everything you do, what can I do to help? And he said to her, get out of my way. Uh, and in many ways, this is the, this idea of wanting to help people uh, who are the products of your own oppression. Uh, in many cases, the best thing you could do to help is get out of the way. Uh, so reversal is not a more advanced position, even though you may be taking on the cause of people who have suffered from uh, domination, who have suffered from oppression, who maybe have suffered from slavery, who uh, have suffered from colonialism or uh, sexism, uh, rather than thinking that you are more advanced by taking on their position, uh, the real advancement is in becoming more able to handle cultural differences associated with that, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, but simply, simply changing sides uh, doesn't make you more sophisticated. So what we hear healthcare workers saying at this point is that uh, these people are in X, you know, country or context or, you know, whatever it is, they should speak the language of this context. Um, essentially, it's treating culture as a language problem that somehow if only people spoke the same language, which we saw in denial, everything would be okay. But here it's coupled with an evaluation that if people have not learned the language, that there must be something uh, wrong with them. Uh, these people should be grateful for the high quality health care they get here as opposed to the primitive care they get in their own countries. And, you know, and the interesting thing about this one is that it works both ways. Uh, so I go back and forth between the US and Italy a lot. And uh, I find that when I'm in Italy, people sometimes say, oh, you know, they don't know how to do that in the US. You know, they're, they're kind of behind, you know, in, in sort of everyday normal care in the US. And when I go to the US and I say something like, I'm gonna get my teeth fixed in Italy, they say, oh no, don't do that. Italians come to the US to get their teeth fixed because things are so primitive there. When of course the healthcare is, you know, perfectly wonderful uh, in both places. So 
this idea that somehow others are more primitive than you are is a particularly uh, sensitive issue, I think, around uh, around healthcare. Uh, and of course, this one is very serious. They don't value life the, the same way we do. And what that may mean is that it, it, uh, it subtly uh, creates uh, the, an evaluation uh, in the in the minds of the healthcare workers that they that they have to be particularly cautious in pushing people uh, from other cultures to uh, follow a med schedule or in other ways uh, 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 follow um, uh, prescriptions and regulations uh, because they probably won't otherwise because they don't value life the same way we do. And this is, of course, just a straight deny, a straight defense position. Uh, here are the reversal positions. I'm ashamed of being a member of the X culture that has colonized these people, or their traditional natural remedies should be a model for all medicine. So it's not like we should take into account natural remedies, which of course we should, but that somehow it becomes superior as opposed to the inferior of inferior allopathic uh, medicine, which is a, a, a reversal and sort of obviously untrue. To deal with defense, the first thing to do is we stress our common humanity, our shared values. Um, a couple of them that are sort of obvious in healthcare situations are parenting and grieving. Uh, that we see these things being expressed in fairly universal ways, although frequently uh, the, the exact demonstration of grieving or exact activities of parenting will be different from culture to culture. But it's usually pretty easy to say to people, look, these people are, you know, they care about their kids, they want the best for their kids, or they're, they're, they are uh, uh, devastated by the loss uh, of a loved one. And, uh, and people can see the common humanity associated with that. So the idea here is to not focus on cultural differences, personal biases, or even to institutional racism. The idea here is to focus on creating commonality, to focus on recognizing our common humanity. And this goes to a really important point here, which is while institutional racism needs to be dealt with at an institutional level, that is, we need to have laws that say you can't stop people from voting, you know, because they're a different color than you are. Uh, you, we, we have to do things to stop people from institutionalizing their, uh, their fear of otherness. That same activity does not work very well in dealing with people's personal biases, that when we give people prejudice reduction training or implicit bias training or other kinds of things, it's really sort of based on the idea that we could introduce something like um, uh, legislation or uh, adjudication uh, that would, uh, that, that would sometimes political correctness police, uh, that would somehow begin to control people's behavior the way we would control institutional behavior. But that's not the way people work. People are not institutions. And the key to uh, getting people out of defense is not to make them stop doing something, it's to make them, it's to encourage them to start doing something that they're not doing. And what they're not doing is they're not seeing other people as equally human. So we need to be working on creating that rather than saying, stop being prejudiced, because the prejudice is nothing but an expression of that seeing other people in simpler terms. You know, what we need to be doing is saying, start seeing other people as being equally human. And it turns out that that's not such a difficult thing to do. We seek activities that demand cooperative action, Team building exercises, basically all team building exercises that are used in uh, organizations are based on the idea of creating a sense of common humanity. So in corporate situations where I work sometimes, you know, the, the, the te new teams will go out and do, <laughs> pre-COVID anyway, they go out and do ropes courses where they all have to help each other to climb between trees or something like that. And inevitably at the end of that process, People say, it doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what shape you're in. It doesn't matter what sex you are. What matters is you're willing to help the other people. In other words, it's a, an affirmation of common humanity. That's what needs to be done at this stage to bring people out of the idea that others are somehow simpler, less complex or less human than they are and into the next stage. Well, there was, sorry, there was, one more there. Oh, using a cultural mediator once again, you know, is a is a good thing to be doing at this stage. 
So what's happening here is that we have a, a conflict between us and them. And us want to you know, win in this view. Uh, and if they do, they become dominant. And uh, them as well uh, resist that. And so they become resistant. The more dominant the other side becomes, and these become exaggerated uh, conditions. Once again, you can see this happening politically in many places in the world right now. Uh, by reconciling us and them, it's not that we all become us or we all become them, it's that we become us and them. You know, that when we think about them, we think about us. When we think about us, we think about them. And when we do that, we're more likely, we're more likely to create a sense of social unity uh, where we see each other as, as being, as we're able to be tolerant, mutually tolerant of one another. And this, this position here uh, is um, not a terribly stable position as I'll tell you in a minute, but it's a necessary stage to go through uh, to get to a truly accepting society where there is in fact a climate of mutual respect for diversity. This is not a climate of respect for diversity. This is a climate of tolerance, uh, but it's the basically necessary position to generate any kind of social unity. So when we move into minimization then, here we're talking about the, the similarity, human similarities, everybody's got two arms, two legs, you know, easy uh, in a healthcare uh, context to come to that view, uh, but also the idea of universal values, that there are some basic things which all of us share as human beings that make us human. And it's important to be stressing those at this point here. What people say at this point is, despite our differences deep down, we're all basically the same, <laughs> like me. You know, nobody ever says we're all the same, like her. You know, it's all we're like me. So there's a kind of projection of this universal reality going on, but at least it's being attributed to others as opposed to seeing others as simpler than yourself. Um, this this is my favorite one here. This is another one of good driver want things. I <laughs> great driver. I have this intuitive sense of other people, no matter what their culture. <laughs> maybe uh, it's more likely that other people are adapting to you and you just don't know what the cultural differences are that they're dealing with. <laughs> yeah. So I, th this is one that kind of bothers uh, people of color in general, at least people I've talked to a lot saying, <laughs> when, whenever you hear somebody from a dominant uh, group saying, I'm tolerant and colorblind, you know, well, people are not really colorblind. You know, what you're saying is, I don't think that color should be the basis for our judgments of one another. That's a good thing to be saying, but probably you should be saying that and not that you're colorblind because in fact, people of color uh, do have an experience of having their color um, um, it become an important factor the way people are inter interacting with them frequently negatively, sometimes positively, but hardly ever in a colorblind way. So not a good thing to say. As long as people have equal opportunity, the rest is up to them. This is the idea that all you have to do is open up the channels, you know, make sure that people, there's no job discrimination going on, and that then there'll be this kind of natural movement, this meritocracy will kick in, and the people who have uh, talents will rise to the top. Uh, unfortunately, this idea really is based on that kind of social Darwinism notion, you know, that there's this hierarchy and that everybody's operating in the same reality. In fact, we are operating in different kinds of realities where we have different kinds of experiences. And unless we take those things into account, people do not have equal opportunity. I talk to CEOs of companies a lot. And they say there's just we 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 don't have discrimination in our job uh, in our job searches and in many cases that's true, uh, but there's just nobody in the pipeline, and and I'll say well why do you think that's true and then and and the, these guys frequently guys will say well they must not want to do it they just they have an opportunity they're just they want to do something else, when in fact they're the the people I'm talking to are not aware that it's not just a matter of having the job search open. It's a matter of how are people being evaluated? What credentials uh, do they theoretically need to be having? What are their chances of being uh, of, 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 of uh, getting promoted when they're in situations like that? There are all kinds of ways in which a dominant culture uh, has essentially made the rules up, not in any conscious way, not in the way to, to, to disadvantage other people, but in a way that that necessarily does advantage people who come from the dominant culture in which those rules have been uh, created. Uh, 
I'm not saying that we should, everybody from the dominant culture should now move into reversal and say, oh, okay, well, let's give up all those rules. You know, somebody's going to make the rules. It's just that we need to be aware of making the rules, do so in a way that's probably, that generates more equity uh, with others and recognize that we are uh, necessarily living with different experiences and that, as we'll see in the next stage, it's good to have those different experiences around. And of course, running against that is the idea that no matter what their culture is, people are pretty much motivated by the same thing, which leads people to uh, not think about how it is to set up uh, different kinds of conditions where, for instance, more pay or uh, more prestige or other things uh, are not necessarily the motivators for people just of different generations, never mind of, di of other kinds of uh, cultures. If you want to know how this works, go to Disneyland or Disney World and get on that little boat and uh, where you'll hear the song, it's a small world after all, sung <laughs> in, in, until it will not leave your brain. Uh, and you know, then you'll see this idea that deep down we're all just human. Uh, children are children the world over. They all love to smile and laugh. And so what's the problem anyway? So what we do for people at minimization, we're developing categories for self-observation that we're, what we're, now is not the time yet to be talking about other cultures. We wanna be talking about our own culture. Seeing yourself in cultural terms is the first stage to being able to then see others in cultural terms. You don't wanna start out with others. So you don't wanna start out saying, let's talk about them as a culture because that then feeds into the defense idea that, oh yes, they have a tribal culture, but we are civilized people. No. No. What you wanna do is see yourself in cultural terms. How do you do that? There are lots of neat exercises, like go to a grocery store and imagine that you're from another planet. You know, why are things the way they are in that grocery store? Um, you know, to look at your house, you know, from the perspective of somebody who doesn't know what any of the appliances are, you know, well, why, is, why are things set up the way they are? Things like that, uh, that uh, exercises that allow you to engage in self, cultural self-awareness. Then um, you can contrast your own cultural behavior with a range of alternatives. So rather than saying, let's learn about Somali culture, let's learn about Costa Rican culture, what it is you're going to say is, Let's understand our own culture and see how it might be different than X, Y, Z, A, B, and C. You know, so you, so you, rather than focusing on one other culture, you provide a range of alternatives to your own culture. Again, with the idea that your own culture is the primary focus. This is not the time to stress this again to provide ethnographies, area studies, or other culture-specific information about other cultures that, in fact, uh, tends to push people back into defense rather than move them uh, into the next stage of acceptance. And, but this is a good time to start having facilitated contact with culturally different others. And this is not the time to have unfacilitated contact. So you don't wanna send people into situations without facilitation to contact people from other cultures because the people from other cultures might well contradict the idea that we are all commonly human in a way that I understand. They might say, hey, you really don't understand this experience. And because people at this stage are not able to recognize, they're not able to handle those cultural differences, it pushes them back into defense and said, oh, well, I thought we were all human, but I guess some people in fact are less human. So that's the danger of pushing people into unfacilitated contact at this stage. Unfortunately, we do this a lot in the name of dialogue, uh, you know, intercultural dialogue and things like that, that where we are not paying attention to the developmental stage that people are in when we throw them into those situations. I mean, people can have unfacilitated dialogue with, with culturally different others, but not until they're operating in ethno-relativism. It's not a good thing to do when people are operating in ethnocentrism. The reason why is because we're stuck in the golden rule and the golden rule to unto others as you would have them done unto you is based on the assumption of similarity. It's based on the idea that we're all just human and that therefore you are able to put yourself into the position of others and understand them. And you know, that works with our friends. And But the reason it works with our friends is because we choose our friends to be similar to ourselves. Lots of evidence that show that we choose to be in homogeneous situations. 
Um, and of course it's better <laughs> than bigotry and prejudice. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't want somebody to kill me, so I guess I won't kill them. Okay, golden rule is pretty good at that level. However, when the golden rule doesn't work is largely in professional roles. Uh, you do not, for the most part, you don't and you shouldn't have chosen the people you work with, uh, even if you could choose them to be similar to you because the whole idea is to have diversity in the workplace that generates more value in a workplace. And but what that means is the golden rule doesn't work. You can't put yourself in another person's position and say, uh, you know, how would I feel in that person's shoes? Because that person is different than you and the golden rule will fail. It also, by the way, fails in personal relationships uh, because for the most part, you have not chosen your partner uh, to be like you. You've used, used the, the assumption of, di of di difference rather than the assumption of similarity for your life partner. Uh, and as a result, the golden rule doesn't work with your partner, you may have noticed. Now, what happens when the golden rule doesn't work is we don't say, oh, that we should be, the people are different, they're not the same. No, we use the lead rule. And the lead rule is, um, do unto others as they should have done unto them. You know, and why? Well, they must be stupid. If we only educate them, if we only explain it more clearly, they'll, they'll agree with us, they'll be like us. And if that doesn't work, we think, well, they must be a little crazy, mentally unstable, having a hormonal storm, whatever it is. And we should only, we should be patient, maybe get therapy, and then they will agree with us. And if that doesn't work, we say, well, they probably just have it against us. And then at that point, it's okay to punish, punish them, control them, or do other things. So unfortunately, when the golden rule doesn't work, meaning when we try to treat other people as if we are, they are similar to us, and they don't respond the way we would respond if we were treated that way, we then shift into this sort of nastier position. When what we should be doing is trying to move towards the platinum rule, the platinum rule being do unto others as they would have done unto them, or at least be aware of how other people would like to be treated, because it is based on the assumption of difference that other people probably, probably want to be treated differently than you, except in these big senses of, you know, they don't want to be killed. They, you know, you don't want to kill, you don't, you want them to kill you. They don't want you to kill them. But in lots of other ways, in the sort of everyday ways that we use the golden rule, in fact, the platinum rule would be superior. If you, uh, this is available along with um, support for many of the other things I'm talking about on the website, uh, www.idrinstitute.org. Um, and this is called Overcoming the Golden Rule, Sympathy and Empathy. All right. So to, to move out of this position of, un, of, of, of uh, minimization, we need to figure out what to do with similarity and difference. And unfortunately, this, this is a big fight that the similarity people say we can't have difference because if we do, uh, it will interfere with, uh, with our similarity. The difference people say we can't have similarity uh, because it becomes uniformity. Uh, and the, the similarity people say, if we have too much difference, it becomes divisiveness. And of course, both of them are correct. Too much similarity generates uniformity. Too much difference generates divisiveness. So rather than having these in fighting with one another, once again, we put them into a reconciliation, into a dialectic where the people who are similar to one another or similarity becomes focus, you know, where we're able to then coordinate ourselves in some common direction and the difference becomes a kind of complementarity where we are able to see that you can do things that I can't do or I can do things that you can do you can't do and that allows us to then pursue a relationship this is what people who have good partnerships whether at work or in their personal lives do is that they have a kind of focused complementarity where they're able to use the different skills uh, towards a common task all right this sets up the conditions to move into ethno-relativism. And in ethno-relativism, we have acceptance of cultural difference, which is respect for behavioral differences, respect for the value differences. Uh, and the, by acceptance, we don't mean agreement. We mean accepting the existence of these equally complex but different kinds of experiences in the world. So when healthcare workers are talking about these kinds of things, they're likely to say things like, people in other cultures are different in ways I hadn't thought of. The more cultures you know about, the better comparisons you can make. Sometimes it's confusing, but knowing what values are different in different cultures. Um, and so and you can still maintain your own values, but you can recognize 
how other people are valuing things differently. All healthcare workers need to be aware of relevant cultural dif differences for some obvious reasons, I suppose many of you recognize. And where can I learn more about why culture? So this is a time when it's okay to bring in specific cultural information about others. When you're building on this, you're using selected resource people. So don't, don't bring in resource people from another culture who say, don't worry about cultural differences, we're all just human. Yeah, those are people who are operating at minimization and they're not good cultural resource people. So you want people to come in who are at least operating at acceptance or an adaptation themselves. If they're in acceptance, means they can talk about their culture in unique ways. If they're in adaptation, they can talk about their culture in a way that makes sense to the people that they're talking to who may be from another culture. Those are the best uh, cultural informant people to be bringing in. Um, you can develop more sophisticated observational categories for uh, recognizing relevant cultural differences. Uh, and again, these are widely available. Uh, in the literature on intercultural communication on how to observe cultural differences in more sophisticated ways. And in practicing understanding these cultural positions with which you disagree, uh, that sounds like a simple thing to do, but uh, if you start doing that for yourself or if uh, as an instructor you try to do that with students, you'll find out that it's a deceptively difficult thing to imagine something that you disagree with in anything other than a negatively evaluative way but that's what you're asking people to do, uh, to imagine the world in some way that would be following a value that is not a value that you have. If you're against capital punishment, imagine in a world in which capital punishment's a good thing to do or vice versa, or if you are a person who thinks people should carry guns around, imagining the world where you couldn't have that, or if vice versa, you're a person who's kind of against carrying guns, but imagining the world as a good place or it being good for people to be carrying guns around. Very, very difficult thing to do, you see. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm only picking out sort of easy issues. I'm not even talking about abortion, you know, or things like that, you know, female genital mutilation. And, you know, there are lots of other more difficult issues where in fact, there are big value differences uh, and it's very difficult to imagine a world in which somebody thinks that's good and to attribute equal humanity to those, not that these are not evil people, these are human people who disagree with you. And uh, that's, that, that's the, the, the practice that we need to do here, but only here. Anytime sooner than this position is too soon to be doing that. And it's difficult enough, even when you're accepting the uh, existence of cultural differences. All right, uh, what this does, and particularly that last exercise, is set you up to be able to engage in adaptation. And adaptation has to do with using empathy, framing, shifting your frame of reference, and uh, eventually being able to generate alternative behavior. It's called uh, code shifting, you know, where you're able to generate authentic behavior uh, in, an, in an, a, a, a different culture. So what people are saying at the stage of adaptation is to solve this problem, I'm going to have to change my approach, change my behavior. I know they're trying to adapt to me, so it's fair that I meet them halfway. I greet people from other cultures uh, differently. That would be one example of a whole bunch of examples of where I may change my style or do something different uh, when I'm dealing with people from uh, another culture. Uh, in all cases, it is that I can maintain my values, I can be myself, but I can behave, I can be myself in culturally diverse ways. Sometimes I ask students, uh, are you the same way with your grandmother than you are with your friend? And they'll say, well, no. And I'll say, well, are you more you with your grandmother or more you with your friend? And you go, well, I'm still me, it's just different. Yeah, so, so that's a good example of how it is that it's within your repertoire to behave in a more with grandmother way or a more with friend way, but to do so where it's still you. That's the uh, ability to maintain authenticity, but uh, in uh, behaviorally different ways. Let's just put it into uh, cultural context. This, of course, raises the issue of who adapts to whom as we move into these multicultural societies. Uh, it used to be that we'd say, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Uh, and these days, we say, everywhere is Rome. <laughs> this, is, this is a group of Japanese kids dressed in togas here. You know, it's a cute picture to 
to uh, illustrate that. The when in Rome do as the Romans is the old assimilation idea, you know, that somehow whoever the dominant culture was could say, you're around us, you should, you have to do it our way. But as we're moving into more and more multicultural situations, it's unclear who gets to say that. Uh, so it's more of an inclusive situation where we have to start thinking, how does this work? If we're not gonna have a dominant culture, that can impose itself on everybody else just because it wants to or because it's got more money or because you know it's willing to fight harder or whatever the reason for it being dominant is um, what would be the alternative and increasingly we those of us who are working on this issue are saying the alternative is something to do with mutual adaptation it's something to do with creating a third position that's neither position a or position b nor is it a and B both assimilating to the organization. It's creating yet another thing. And we call this virtual third culture, uh, where somebody from culture A is adapting to the organization, including somebody from B. Somebody from culture B is adapting to the organization, including culture A. And that generates an intersectional space. And then you'll hear this term sometimes used in postmodern theory or critical theory, intersectionality. And this is a particular use of that term where we are generating a more constructivist use of the term, where we are generating a virtual condition that exists between A and B, which we're calling the third culture. The third culture doesn't take over. It doesn't become the culture. It exists only in the intersection between A and B in the organization. And that uh, what that and in, in from that intersection is where value flows into and out of the relationship between A, B, and the organization. It's this kind of thinking, this more dynamic creation of intersectional spaces that we feel is an alternative uh, to who gets to dominate uh, or who's fighting back against the domination uh, that uh, is not taking us past defense, basically in our multicultural situations. We feel that this is a more ethno-relative uh, position. This sets up the, the conditions for integration. Um, and integration, as I said before, is not social integration. It doesn't mean uh, that we're not segregated. It means that we are integrating the acceptance and adaptation into the way in which we are uh, habitually and every day operating in reality. Typically, this means that we are able to move to the margins of culture and move in and out of cultures. Um, many times people who are bicultural, and actually most people are at least bicultural, it's just we don't think of it that way. I mean, most women, for instance, are bicultural with men. You know, they know how to operate in men's culture. Fewer men maybe are bicultural with women, but you know we tend to be generationally bicultural. So we're not just nationally bicultural. We may be bicultural in racial terms or in other kinds of terms. So when we have this biculturality, it allows us to move in and out of cultures. Then the more uh, the more conscious we are of that, the more that we're able to see our position here as a in the in the middle as being a position of liminality, of being comfortable in this in between position it generates the potential for intercultural consciousness. And intercultural consciousness is our ability to operate uh, uh, in um, ways that are, here, let me, uh, the, the perceptual ability to generate useful observations about your own and other cultures, the metacognitive ability to exercise agency in the construction of conceptual boundaries, because that so that means that you are not only able to observe your own culture and then use those strategies for observing cultural difference, you're also able to see that you're the one drawing the boundaries. You're the one who are creating those observational categories. I mean, not you personally, but you know, in concert with the people that you are working with and as part of the, the education that you're receiving that we collectively are creating these uh, conceptual boundaries. And therefore, we can create them in different ways. And in fact, in every relationship, every perceptual relationship we have at every instant, we are creating those boundaries. If we want to change those boundaries, we just need to start doing it in a different way. We can essentially create the future now. The emotional resilience, in addition to respecting, is uh, also being able to respect the values of others while maintaining the commitment to your own, which I think is an important 
thing for us to be able to do in these multicultural societies. So what this, uh, so so what you hear people saying at this position are sometimes I feel marginal in groups, but I'm able to move in and out of them with relative ease. My decision making skills are improved by having access to multiple cultural perspectives. So when I'm talking to executives or managers and organizations, that's what I'm listening for, and I don't hear it that often. But when I do, I'm very impressed that uh, people recognize that access to multiple perspectives is in fact a value, which is difficult to get otherwise. Everywhere is home, if you know how things work there. Uh, I feel more comfortable when I'm bridging differences. This is a very common position for people who are in uh, healthcare situations who themselves have a lot of multicultural experience. They may uh, choose that bridge making position. What it does is it puts them into liminal space, into that in between space quite a bit. And they like being there. It's like living in the third culture in a lot of ways. And, uh, and uh, that's a comfortable position, position for people at this uh, stage of development. I usually can look at things from a variety of cultural points of view. And in an intercultural world, everybody needs to have intercultural consciousness. And again, I use this term um, as the general skill that underlies intercultural competence, cultural competence, uh, cultural intelligence, intercultural sensitivity, all of the terms that we use that are, are being used for different academic or commercial purposes, all I think refer to these three things. They refer to our ability to generate useful observations. The ability, they uh, refer to our ability to be an agent in the construction of our own boundaries and to this kind of emotional resilience. So I wish you good luck in not only your own development, but in helping to facilitate others. And I trust that this has been useful uh, towards that end. Thanks for your attention.